So there's a lot of demand for computing degrees. Uh, you're all aware of this increase expected to be 22% between 2020 and 2030. That's led to huge increases undergrad enrollment. Uh, so this is a picture of Berkeley. Uh, intro computer science with 1,098 students. You know, computing courses are the, the largest courses at Harvard, the largest courses at Stanford. There's just huge demand. Um, and then the failure rate in these intro courses is often pretty high. So the average is 28%, but it can be as high as 92%. Like most people fail, right? So it varies quite a bit. In some places, it's a weeder course, especially when there's 1,000 students. They don't care if they lose a lot of them. Um, and computing isn't diverse. And unfortunately, the people that are missing are often the people that are most at risk in these giant courses uh, because they have less prior experience. There's, there's just not a lot of access prior to undergrad. There are some high school courses, but only about 4% of high school students are taking them. So we're just not getting enough people uh, with experience ahead of time. So they come into undergrad, they have these giant courses, this is office hours waiting at Cornell one to three hours just to get help. And, and I teach SI206, which is an intermediate programming course. And I get a lot of people who come from engineering and they're like, I can get help here. I don't have to wait hours just to see if I can get help. I can actually get help. You know, because they're used to waiting hours just to see if they even can get in the queue to get help, right? And unfortunately, we mostly make people learn computing or programming by writing code from scratch. And this is overwhelming often for beginners. They get stuck. It takes an unexpected long amount of time. They can't get help. They don't know what's going on. How do they get help in a timely manner? So that's one of the things that I've been working on for a while. And I've been creating interactive eBooks, uh, and particularly studying Parsons problems, which is a kind of problem. So rather than make you just write code from scratch, I give you all the correct code, but I break it into blocks and mix it up, sort of like refrigerator magnets. And you have to drag it into the right place with the right indentation for Python. Um, and my prior work so far up to date was about that learners usually solve these faster, significantly faster than writing the equivalent code with similar learning games. So they're learning about the same, but in less time, which is always good. But interestingly, not if the solution is unusual, which, which makes sense. If it's not the way the students would solve it, and a person's problem usually just has one correct solution, then that can be more confusing to them. That's not the way I would do it. Um, but learners are usually twice, nearly twice as likely to correctly solve adaptive Parsons problems as, versus non-adaptive. And one of the things I've done is make them adaptive so that you drag stuff over from left to right. And you'll notice there are these purple edges on the left that say or. So these are pairs of correct and incorrect code to get you to think about what's the correct thing. So you drag it into order. You check your answer. It highlights things that are wrong. If you submit at least three incorrect solutions, it says you can get help. And so one of the things it does is if you used an incorrect block, that animates going back and grays out. Now it just provided indentation, which is a clue. And then it starts combining blocks if you keep asking for help. And I do that until you get down to three blocks. And then I say, hey, come on, three blocks. You should be able to put that in order. So that's one of the things I've done. Um, and learners are nearly twice as likely to correctly solve adaptive than non-adaptive. So it seems to be working for people that it helps guide them to the correct solution. Um, most learners, about 82% in my most recent, uh, from winter 22, report the Parsons problem helped them learn. We do have some people that don't like them because there is one correct solution in a Parsons problem and there's many ways to write code. So there are people that are like, I'd rather just write the code. So one of the things we've added is sure, Parsons problems are intended to be scaffolding to help you if you're struggling. If you're not struggling, by all means, write the code. So we've often added a toggle so that if you're presented a Parsons problem, you can switch to the equivalent write code problem. Go ahead. And that brought up an interesting idea too, which is what I did for my career. How about we use Parsons problem to scaffold people while they're writing code? So if people are trying to write code and they're stuck, you could have an intelligent tutoring system, but those are really expensive to create and they're not widely used and they're rather fragile. But we know an answer, right? <laughs> when, we write your, when we write the solution, we know what an answer is. So what if you're struggling while you're writing this, you have the ability, this is a little toggle feature at the top, to pop up the Parsons problem. You could even solve it here. You'd still have to type it over here. You can't switch to it because Parsons problems are easier than writing the code. So at least you'd have to retype the solution. 
We've already tested this with students in 206. Um, and we find a variety of, of interesting things, interesting behavior. Some of them pop it up immediately just to look at the person's blocks to get an idea of what the solution might look like without solving it. Some of them start to solve it, and if they get stuck, then they pop up the person's problem to try to look at that to see, oh, I forgot about that syntax. What is that syntax? They don't necessarily solve it. Others of them will solve the problem, but if they have errors still, because we have unit tests to test their solution. So if they have errors in the unit test, they'll pop up the person's problem to debug their solution, which is also useful because we know that students aren't good at debugging. So different ways people are doing this. So what are we going to do in the, in the career award? So in the career award, we're going to auto-generate two different kinds of Parsons problems. So I've integrated Parsons problems in several different interactive eBooks. One of my eBooks is being used for high school computer science, advanced placement computer science. We had 30,000 people use it in the fall. So we have lots of student written code. So we're going we're gonna to grab that data and use it so that we can figure out what's the most common student written solution. And we can use Overcode, which is open source software, to cluster student, correct student solutions. And then we can generate Parsons problem for the most common student solution. And then our real interesting idea is personalized Parsons problem. So if you're writing the incorrect code, can we find the closest correct code and serve you that dynamically as a personalized Parsons problem? So we're going to study that. In uh, the, our research questions are here, we're going to compare the most common solution to no scaffolding at all, and then the most common solution to personalized solution. I'm going to be working in my Python course, SI206, first with you know, a few volunteers to try it out, then with undergrads in 206, and then I'm also creating an online course based on my course, which typically has a lot of, will have a lot of people over time. And then in uh, Java, another language, I'm running this project Sisters Rise Up to help women of color succeed in high school computer science, so we can try to get some volunteers from that. Undergrad students that are using the equivalent high school book because it is a college level CS1, so we have a bunch of undergrad courses using that, and then also secondary students using that book. CS Awesome is the name of the book. We're going to use Think Aloud within subject studies, between subject studies with pretests and potests. Uh, self-efficacy surveys and end of course surveys and look at retention data in the courses and these are the kinds of analysis we'll do thematic analysis of the think log transcripts we'll compare between subjects data with independent samples t-test or a man whitney u if it's not normal data we'll compare self-efficacy survey data with paired t-test or wilkes we'll, i can't even say that will coxon sign rank test and we'll report frequency distributions for end of course surveys and compare retention rates so that's the plan and of course, I'm just trying to change the world, as most of us are. <laughs>